Welcome to the webinar of a recorded demo of the shoulder ultrasound examination with Daniel Shelton and Bill Medford. Daniel Shelton is the director of MSK Market Development with 16 years of experience as an MSK sonographer. Bill Medford is the lead MSK specialist with 40 years of experience as a sonographer, with 22 years of that experience as an MSK sonographer. This first slide shows the anatomy that will be covered today, and Bill will begin with a quick review of anisotropy in just a moment. Enjoy. So our objectives today, um, real, we're not going to go too much in the history of musculoskeletal because we want to be sure we cover the anatomy that we're put to task to discuss with you today. Um, we're going to talk about this term called anisotropy. Um, without understanding anisotropy, um, it, it's difficult to really understand the images that we're looking at. Primary purpose today is to review the anatomy that we're going to be looking at, as well as the patient and transducer position, which I'll cover as part of the PowerPoint, but Daniel will cover better in the live demonstration as well as technique. The anatomy that we cover when we're doing a, an ultrasound examination of the shoulder include these um, uh, particular anatomical parts, the bicep tendon, the long head of the bicep tendon, the subscapularis, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendon, a little bit of a look at the teres minor on occasion, and the posterior shoulder, particularly to get a peek at the posterior labrum and the all important spinal glenoid notch, as well as a quick peek at the AC joint to look for any gapping of the acromial clavicular joint, as well as degenerative change that might be present. We're also going to look going to occasionally look at the suprascapular notch as well as needed. Anisotropy is the loss of reflectivity to the transducer due to off perpendicular incident sound beam angle. The normal tendon appearance really depends on that incident angle of the ultrasound beam being roughly perpendicular to the tendon so that the echoes reflect back to the transducer. In an off perpendicular beam, it's much like shining a flashlight into a mirror at an angle. It doesn't come back and get you in the eyes. It, it reflects over to the side. The angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. So if you're 90 degrees to the beam with your, or to the anatomical part with your transducer, the beam or the sound beam reflects directly back to the transducer and the echoes are displayed. The importance of understanding anisotropy is that the presence of anisotropy can be a pitfall because it can mimic a focal area of tendon injury or it can reduce or prevent visualization of intra or peritendinous pathology in particularly fluid defects or peritendinous fluid. Again, if the echoes reflect back to the transducer, you will have bright echoes displayed on your monitor. If the echoes reflect back away from the transducer, then you have zones of echo dropout or darkness without those echoes coming back. And so seeing dark fluid against a dark tendon um, makes it more difficult to recognize uh, the fluid defect or peritendinous fluid that could be present. Example of anisotropy we see here in this short axis view of the bicep tendon. Notice the transducer angle back and forth. When it's brightened, the transducer angle is perpendicular to the tendon. When it's off perpendicular, you have echo dropout and an echo pore appearance of the bicep tendon. Here we see a still image with an appropriate incident sound beam angle and an off perpendicular incident sound beam angle and you have uh, anisotropy present as a result. Anisotropy is very important to understand and recognize when we're looking at the rotator cuff in particular, in particular, this zone of insertion um, at the proximal part of the footprint where the tendon fibers curve more steeply back to their insertion. Notice that more distally, we see tendon fibers more parallel and more gently curving back to their enthesis. So anisotropy is less problematic here 
than it is at the proximal footprint. So we do not want to mistake this area of echo dropout for a fluid defect um, suggesting a possible tear. To um, account for this anisotropy, we want to slide the transducer over more distally to direct our sound beam so that the incident sound beam is encountering those fibers at 90 degrees. We start the shoulder exam uh, by looking at the long head of the bicep tendon in the short axis with the patient in a neutral position, palm up resting on the thigh. The transducer is placed across the humerus and the bicipital groove that we see here. Bone on ultrasound is hyperechoic. We, sound does not transmit through bone. This, these echoes are all artifactual echoes from ring down artifact, but the bone should be smooth and hyperechoic. And then we see the tendon in the middle of the bicipital groove, transverse humeral ligament coursing over the top of it, where it's at the deepest part of the intertubercular groove. Note that adjacent to the bicep tendon is a small arterial structure to be aware of when you're uh, advancing a needle, if we're advancing it toward the posterior lateral aspect of the tendon and delivering our injectate there, we want to be aware of the location of this small artery. We want to scan the bicep tendon from its proximal location distally to the myotendinous junction, which is at the same level as where we encounter the pectoralis tendon and its insertion onto the humerus. You can confirm the uh, pectoralis tendon. And of course, eh, come on video. You can externally rotate the patient's arm and show the, the humor, humerus pulling the pectoralis tendon back and forth. At this level, we see the myotendinous junction deep to the pectoralis tendon here. Short head of the bicep tendon is adjacent to it. More images as we see here and anatomical uh, images as well of the bicep tendon in the short axis. Once we've looked in the short axis, we're going to flip the transducer 90 degrees to where we'll see the longitudinally oriented fibers of the uh, long head biceps. We see the um, uh, bony signature of the humerus deep here, fibrillar pattern of the bicep tendon, the more pennate pattern of the overlying deltoid muscle, superficial fatty layer of tissue, and of course the skin. The bicep tendon can be, when you're, when you're just starting, a little bit difficult to locate. So um, Daniel will demonstrate um, when we go to live scanning here in just a moment, one little pearl for recognizing that. And that is, if you're medial to the bicep tendon in a longitudinal plane, you'll notice that the echogenicity of the bone disappears distally. If you're lateral to the bicep tendon, the bony signature remains present all the way down. So if you're lateral to it and you see bone all the way down, you know you need to slide the transducer slightly medial to encounter the fibers of the bicep tendon. If you're medial to it, the bone falls off. Daniel, I'll let you take it from here. Biceps, I'm just gonna start on the anterior biceps. I like to start with my palm on top of the acromion if I'm, if I'm scanning in this plane here. And just about everything in the rotator cuff can be seen about an inch from the acromion. So we're, we're really looking for the, um, the bicipital groove is a, is a hard uh, bony uh, cortical landmark here. I wanna see medially, I wanna see the lesser tuberosity. I can see the anisotropic subscapularis. And then look at how rounded the greater tuberosity. So they're, they're very different. If you don't see anything in, in the groove, check your angle, like Bill said. We have to toggle the transducer for anisotropy. So if, if you're still seeing an empty groove, start looking medially for a dislocated uh, bicipital tendon. It'll be sitting either on top of the subscap, or if you have a torn subscap also, the, the bicipital tendon will jump out and land, uh, land itself underneath some of those fibers or all of them, where I've seen a few down into the joint. 
So uh, just something to be on the lookout for when you're scanning a transverse image of a bison. If you're not seeing something, um, go find it. So now I'm gonna scan a little bit more distally down to the pectoralis, as Bill mentioned. We should see it as this nice horizontal fibrillar striated structure coming in from medial to lateral, inserting here on this on that ridge on the humerus. I'm gonna have Jamie slowly externally rotate, and we're gonna watch that pectoralis stretch out. And I can still see the bicipital tendon uh, right here underneath it nicely. Go ahead and relax, James. Thank you. And then what I'm gonna do is just pull my transducer further north, back up into the groove. So at that point, I've, I've scanned enough in transverse for the more um, prominent pathology that, that would be shown. I don't really need to go any further than the pectoralis unless it's clinically indicated. So next, I'm gonna switch over to the long axis. Uh, to do this, you can either put your finger in the middle of the transducer, you'll see there's a little black arrow there, and then I'm just gonna spin the probe so that the um, dot is facing north, which is the left side of the screen and that's called the orientation marker. You see the little sonocyte logo in the upper left, and that is representative of this ridge on the handle. And that's on every ultrasound transducer. It's not specific to this one. It's not the dot right here, for example. It's always the ridge on the handle. So what I'm gonna do is just keep that bicipital tendon and long axis now, and I'm gonna do what Bill had mentioned in that PowerPoint, which is a very useful way of just combing through the groove. And I'm gonna go medially, where I see bony apex of the lesser tuberosity. Remember it was a bony point in transverse. It, it's the same thing in, in long axis, but we've dropped off the humerus completely. Now let's go back into the groove. If we still haven't seen anything, we need to comb through there laterally too. As I scan laterally, I do still see humerus. So I know that I've gone over the greater tuberosity. So there I've scanned all the way through bicipital tendon and it's short axis and it's long axis. And I'll just turn it back over to Bill as he starts the subscapping. When I look, when I begin to look um, and try to orient myself on the patient with my transducer, I'll start by looking, going back to my, to the bicep tendon in the deepest part of the groove with the, tra with the patient still in neutral position. Ultimately, I'm going to have them externally rotate their arm, and that will bring the subscapularis out under the transducer so that we can see the bony footprint of the lesser tuberosity. We know we're seeing the humeral head when we begin seeing this rim of our hypoechoic articular cartilage over the top. See the overlying bursa, and overlying that is the deltoid muscle. Important to remember that as we're scanning through the long axis of any tendon, but of the subscap as well, that we interrogate it up through its superior margin as well as its inferior margin. So a transducer placed in one location must be remembered to, um, it must be remembered that you're not interrogating the entirety of the, of the tendon. So it may look good right here, but you may have a tear up more toward the superior um, margin of the subscap. To look at the, uh, at the subscapularis and the short axis, we're gonna turn the transducer 90 degrees, remembering the importance of scanning from proximal to distal. Once we have our transducer across the fibers of the subscap and we slide it distally far enough, we'll encounter the longitudinally oriented fibers of the bicep tendon, which then tells us that we've interrogated through the entire proximal to distal extent of the, uh, of the subscapularis tendon. The coracoid is often a good bony landmark to start your short axis interrogation of the subscapularis from. When you come, when you proceed with the transducer distally far enough, you'll notice that the bone flattens to tell you that you're over the insertion of the subscap fibers, and you'll see um, um, bundles of tendon and the interpositioning hypoechoic uh, interface that's not to be mistaken for vertical tearing, and Daniel will demonstrate that. Uh, and the change in the shape of bone when you proceed from the rounded humeral head to the more flattened appearance of the lesser tuberosity. Daniel? All right. 
here we go again with the subscapularis. I like to start at the bicipital groove. So it's kind of a nice, lazy way to scan it. But um, right there, we see the biceps groove, and we know that the, the, that the uh, subscapularis is going to insert right here on the lesser tuberosity anyway. And if the lesser tuberosity is not very prominent, we're not getting a lot of attachment. So really staying on the, the very most pointed part of that, of that lesser tuberosity puts you right in the middle, ready to, ready to deliver that subscapularis anteriorly. So really, all you have to do is have the patient just um, externally rotate and bring the subscapularis out to you. And you don't have to move your transducer much. I like to still scan uh, very north and south. So here I am going lower. Now, one thing about scanning in MSK, especially in the shoulder, is that this shoulder is shaped like a ball. So you saw as I went inferiorly, I needed to aim superiorly so that I could still be firing my beam on the surface of that ball where the subscapularis is still inserting on a bump on the ball, uh, um, the tuberosity there. Now when I go up further north, I don't scan like this. I'm just doing this so that you can see it a little bit better. As I go further north and I, I make it all the way to the interval, I need to aim down because I'm still scanning the surface of a ball. So as I traverse across the surface of the ball, you'll see my transducer tilt and I'm ignoring the tendon at first. And I'm really just keeping an eye on that cortex because everything in the shoulder is wrapped around that ball. So if you're 90 degrees to the cortex, you're already 90 degrees to the surface of the tendon. So that's kind of my, one of, one of my big um, pointers for scanning the shoulder is you're scanning a curved surface that the tendons are already wrapped around. And if the subscapularis is torn or has a defect in it and you're not sure you're getting the right angle on it, as long as the cortex is nice and bright, typically your tendon is really nice and bright. So now what I'm gonna do is just turn the transducer short axis to the subscapularis. Let's go find out which part of the subscap I landed on. Um, there I'm, I'm right across the footprint. And what I'm gonna do is bring this transducer all the way over to the coracoid. And I like this, this is a, a tip from Bill. There I am on the coracoid. And I'm just gonna aim the beam back into the humeral head there. So there I'm 90 degrees to the surface of the humeral head. Bump up my gain just a touch. And I'm just gonna have uh, Jamie internally rotate we're gonna watch those fibers come right across my beam, kind of like I did from the biceps to the subscap. And then here comes the biceps right there. So there I'm long axis to the biceps, which, which makes sense because the biceps runs 90 degrees to the subscap. So there I'm in the northernmost part of the groove, exiting the interval. And I'm gonna have Jamie slowly externally rotate. There's the beginning of the footprint of the lesser tuberosity. There's those little interdigitated slips. Don't confuse those for a tear. I'm just gonna rest Jamie's hand down there and I'm gonna point those out. So I'm gonna use anisotropic artifact to my advantage. There we go. And basically see these little hypoechoic slips? Those are just a dense layer of connective tissue taking a different direction to insert between the main tendon bundles here. So here we've got a, a tendon bundle another tendon bundle, and another tendon bundle. But in between them, these aren't fluid. These are just little septations between those tendon bundles of a different layer of connective tissue taking a slightly different direction, causing a bit more anisotropy. If I were to travel further north, I would start getting into that rotator cuff interval. And Bill's going to speak on that here uh, shortly. So Bill, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay, let's talk about the rotator interval a little bit. A very important um, anatomical part of the rotator cuff examination. The rotator interval is recognized by the short axis view of the bicep tendon with subscapularis on one side and supraspinatus on the other side. Some important ligamentous structures um, sit both in front of the bicep tendon as well as behind the bicep tendon, and they serve to keep to stabilize the bicep tendon 
in its intraarticular location. These two structures, the one deep to it is the superior glenohumeral ligament, and superficial to the bicep tendon is the coracohumeral ligament. Notice the oblique relationship of the undersurface of the bicep tendon to the bone. When we see the bicep tendon sitting directly on the bone and that we've lost this oblique relationship, um, there is pos there, you want to interrogate the superior glenohumeral ligament closely for possible tear and retraction. The overlying coracohumeral ligament will sometimes appear thickened in cases of adhesive capsulitis. So we see the anatomic position of the bicep tendon, the supraspinatus, and on the other side of this would be the subscapularis tendon. Transducer position is much like what we'll, how we'll position the transducer when we're looking at short axis views of the supraspinatus with the medial side of the transducer directed toward the patient's sternum. The, the patient's arm can be pushed, put into a modified crass position, or oftentimes in a patient with this body habitus, you can just have them relax their arm down by their side and to rotate the bicep tendon over on top, as opposed to off to the side either way, you can just rotate the patient's arm and that will move the bicep tendon to the location where you can see it the best. Oftentimes we're asked, where does supraspinatus end and infraspinatus begin? One thing that we can do is look at the change in the shape or the contour of the bone when we're over the greater tuberosity and recognize these two facets. The superior facet, or sometimes called the anterior facet, and the middle facet. The superior facet, which is adjacent to the bicep tendon, which we see here, and the other bony acoustic landmark, the coracoid, the superior facet houses the insertional fibers of the supraspinatus. Some of the insertional fibers of the supraspinatus occupy the more anterior portion of the middle facet as well. The middle facet is, is the primary insertion point for the infraspinatus, which you see a little bit of here as it folds over the top of the supraspinatus to come to its point of insertion on that middle facet. The inferior facet, as we see in this Jacobson drawing, is what houses the fibers of the teres minor. So here we see the proximal footprint, or not footprint, excuse me, proximal portion of the supraspinatus, and we see the rounded appearance of the humeral head. When we're in the rounded appearance of the humeral head, we're going to see this oblique line that interposes itself where we see the overriding infraspinatus fibers coursing over the top of the underlying supraspinatus fibers. So we look for this oblique line in the more proximal portion of the tendon to recognize what represents infraspinatus and what represents supraspinatus. When we're over the greater tuberosity, again, we have this um, more uh, Matterhorn shaped, if you will, um, shaped to the bone and we see infraspinatus primarily on the middle facet and the supraspinatus on the superior facet. Before we go to the supraspinatus, Daniel, do you want to demonstrate um, the rotator interval? All right, so what I've done is I've positioned our model Jamie just arm relaxed, and I want to see what I can see without having to go into that modified crass or anything. So uh, the way to find the interval is go back to your bicepital groove. And we're gonna follow the bicep up north. And when it starts to go oblique on you on the screen, it's time to turn your transducer and keep going north while pointing down to the humeral. It's a ball shaped surface and I need to keep aiming 90 degrees to the ball shaped surface of the humeral head. So as I traverse up towards the interval, as long as this cortex is nice and bright, the rest of these structures are gonna come in really, really nice. So here's. Here's your subscapularis, here's your supraspinatus, and then now the biceps is seemingly floating on top of some soft tissue here. 
and that makes up the superior glenohumeral ligament, which glides underneath the biceps and stabilizes it like a hammock. And then on top of the biceps here is the coracohumeral ligament, which also has fibers that start to invade the, the anterior margin of the supraspinatus is underneath a uh, footprint on top of the, the articular cartilage of the, the humeral head. So our supraspinatus hasn't really started until this edge right here. Because here we can see some of that coracohumeral ligament kind of interdigitating itself underneath. And I can get it almost slightly long axis right there. Really, really nice on this sonocyte export machine here. This uh, image quality is very nice. I can see this ligament all the way up and over the bicep, all the way up underneath the supraspinatus. So now what I'm going to do is just keep following and centering until I have the supraspinatus in the shot. And I'm going to go distal now, slightly distal. And let's watch this bony contour. I'm going to ignore the anisotropic artifacts until I find that, as Bill mentioned, that Matterhorn kind of shape. Um, I should see the greater tuberosity change its, its, its shape. So there we go. And I start to see the anterior or superior facet. And then there was the middle facet making itself known here. I'm going to add a little bit of gel. I'm going to heap up a, a bit of gel just so it makes it easier to follow this contour of Jamie's shoulder. I'm also going to bring her elbow back just slightly because I feel like I'm going to, I need to bring out just a few more fibers. So here we are um, on the ball shape of the humeral head. And there I'm just going to fall laterally until I start to see that apex start to show itself there. So here's our anterior uh, facet and our middle. Here we see the infraspinatus and supraspinatus isolated. So if you're wondering, you know, where does uh, one begin and the other end, um, this is kind of the division point where we get about one third of the supraspinatus jumps up and over to the middle facet, and then the infraspinatus will still share about a third of its fibers jumping over the supraspinatus itself to, to insert on uh, about a third of the anterior or superior facet. Bill, I hope that did it justice. Daniel? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm just going to ask you to do one other thing. Sure. Um, work a little more proximally over the humeral head and show that oblique line where you see the infraspinatus overriding the uh, supraspinatus. So you, um, there you go, right there. Beautiful. Go ahead. There it is, right there, Bill. So, so when you're more that. proximal, that's what you're looking for to recognize or distinguish the uh, infraspinatus from the supraspinatus. Thanks, Daniel. We've talked about the short angle or short axis view of the supraspinatus and the transducer position on the shoulder, basically 90 degrees to this, where the transducer would be placed with the medial side of the transducer directed toward the sternum. Let's look now at the long axis view and the transducer position to demonstrate the longitudinally oriented fibers of the supraspinatus as they come out from under the acromion more proximally. Occasionally, you will see the myotendinous junction. Oftentimes, the patient cannot provide enough internal rotation to, um, um, to bring that out from uh, under the acromion. So the patient is put into the modified crass position and internally rotated. The internal rotation does stress more of the proximal fibers out from under where we can see them better. We want the superior end of the transducer oriented slightly toward the patient's ear to demonstrate that. Keep in mind that as we internally rotate, we bring those tendon fibers that, for a, that typically in a neutral position come out and we see them in a coronal MR plane, they're going to rotate around more anteriorly, thus the transducer position slightly more anterior located than you might think they would be. It's that internal rotation that brings them around more anterior. Once we do that and we see this correlative ultrasound image with an MR image, we see proximal and distal, the humeral head overlying hypoechoic articular cartilage, the footprint of the greater tuberosity, and this characteristic bird's beak view of the supraspinatus tendon. The anatomical neck is located here. Oftentimes when you're at the supraspinatus tendon, this anatomical neck will be more pronounced and the distinction between the humeral head 
and the um, there will be more of a step off from the humeral head to the greater tuberosity. I'm going to change Jamie's position now to that modified crafts, which is the palm in the back pocket, and make sure the elbow is not out. That will internally rotate the cuff, and it will go underneath the coracoid, and we won't see the anterior margin. So let's bring Jamie's elbow towards her spine, and that's going to bring out the cuff structures where we can more clearly see them. Uh, typically, I do like to go find the biceps. Again, everything starts at the biceps. So they're immediately, just for, I wouldn't scan this way, but I want you to see the transducer position. Here's the biceps, and then the arrow is there um, already, just right over the supraspinatus. I'm gonna switch hands now, so I'm more comfortable. And I like to start out in a transverse plane um, on the supraspinatus, and I like to just say, hey, I can, I can see the entire volume of the rotator cuff in this one shot. This, this would be the equivalent of a wheel. This analogy is really, really good. Um, so this is a wheel and this is a tire. We have a properly inflated tire. So if I had a flat tire, whether it be from this uh, top surface or the underneath surface full of fluid, I would know that there's been volume loss there. It would be compressible. I could squish the volume out and tell whether or not it was bursal in nature or if it was articular in nature. And, uh, and you know, likewise, you don't wanna, you, you can see that I have gel in the upper corner of the image. If I'm looking at somebody else's pictures and I see a nice rotator cuff tear, I almost wonder how much they're missing by the amount of pressure they're applying. So if you're seeing a little bit of gel in the corner, that's good. It's showing that I'm not collapsing new, otherwise useful pathology right here. Uh, you do not want to collapse little partial tears. They will show themselves with very light pressure. I'll scan as proximal as I can until I start to hit the coracoid or the acromion. And then I'll, I'll come back in uh, until I see the anthesis at those facets that, that we talked about on the interval slide there. So I will go long axis now. I'm gonna turn the transducer and let's talk about this bird's beak looking uh, landmark, which is the coronal equivalent on your MRI, right? So here's the humeral head, humeral head. Here's the anatomical neck Bill spoke about. Here's the greater tuberosity. Now, do I stop there? It looks good. Um, no, we're not done investigating. In fact, if you see a flat greater tuberosity, You've not gone anterior enough. So what I need to do is I need to slide the transducer towards the coracoid like this until I see that that kind of ski jump inflection point of the greater tuberosity has changed to a curve. When it changes to this curve shape, really that, that um, anatomical neck is going to start showing itself to be more like the groove housing the biceps. So in the interval, here's the biceps. And I know my next immediately lateral structure is the supraspinatus. So what I'm going to do is just slowly pull the transducer just a few millimeters, maybe a, maybe a centimeter tops um, laterally until I see this nice pronounced curve shape. I'm going to spend a little bit of extra time on this because this is everybody's most favorite shot in all of the shoulder and they need to be able to get it right. So if you're over the flat part of the greater tuberosity, you're on the middle facet. You're mostly infraspinatus. You're going to call these little oblique lines, these inner digitations, you're going to call those partial tears in your early learning curve. These are not partial tears. These are, this is an oblique infraspinatus coming in and it's going to throw you off. So make sure you don't just stop at the bird's beak looking shape and say, I got it. There's my rotator cuff. It looks fine. Um, make sure that you're panning as far medial so far that you see the biceps in the interval down here it's going to look like a big arc down there in the joint basically once you see that remember that the biceps in the interval runs parallel with the supraspinatus so you don't have to change the direction of your transducer and if you're fairly new at this get used to that um that that muscle memory of going from the biceps make it a drill and make it something that you do repetitively when you have a volunteer to scan. Biceps, supraspinatus, biceps, supraspinatus. And just do that until it's a very natural movement with the transducer. Remember, we're, we're scanning the curve shape of the, of the humeral head as well. So because Jamie's already internally rotated, the infraspinatus fibers have come all the way around anteriorly. So here we are on infraspinatus because she's so far internally rotated that is a long axis infraspinatus. That's not a supraspinatus right there. 
Everybody see my transducer position? If you were looking at an anatomy book, that would look really weird because you would never place your transducer there for an infraspinatus looking at the anatomy book. You'd be way back here. Back here, you'll get into the muscle, and Bill will present on that next, but she's not in anatomical position anymore. We've gone from an externally rotated, go ahead and just go into palm forward. That would be anatomical position would be just palm forward. Um, in fact, if I did that, then her, her footprint for the infraspinatus would be way back there. And we can see that just under the arrow here. So we'll get into the infraspinatus next, but I just want to remind everybody that we're in this position, we've rolled the cuff structures all anteriorly, and they're all gonna be really close to the biceps, which is extremely medial at this point. So don't ever stop scanning until you locate the biceps, Oops. or you're gonna end up with a lot of false negatives. You're gonna miss rotator cuff tears. If you don't see the biceps and start working your way laterally, um, you're gonna miss a whole lot of those anterior margin tears, which is the ones that everybody cares about. And that's where most of the pathology is, as we all know, is insertional tears at the most anterior part of the supraspinatus. Hey, Daniel, yep. um, we had a question about the rotator cable. Are you sure. able to demonstrate that? Um, I'll give it a shot. It's been a while since I've really scanned it, but I did. I know. I'm glad right. you're scanning. <laughs> yeah. I, I did. I'm not scan. sure I could. I, um, I read a really nice article on that that was put out just uh, recently, actually. It's an anatomical dissection of that. So from this view of the biceps and you see that that short axis supraspinatus go more proximal than that so the cable is going to be this almost horizontal extension of the capsule in in relative nature to how deep it is it's going to be on that extreme undersurface there we go the extreme undersurface of the supraspinatus here is this ligamentous band going right underneath the the, the main body of the supraspinatus here and there's a lot of cartilage in the image. So this is a long axis view of the cable here, which is coming off that most anterior network of ligaments, such as the uh, superior glenohumeral ligament, the corcohumeral ligament. So that would be a long axis view. I'm extremely proximal. And you can see those long axis ligament fibers underneath the muscle belly of the supraspinatus. So here's the anterior tendon. Here's the myotendinous junction here. I'm going to go long axis to the supraspinatus. And we should see an oval shape in short axis, I've not scanned this on Jamie's shoulder. I know what it looks like on mine, but right in here, here we go. This, this ligament band right here that sets itself just underneath the supraspinatus before it becomes musculotendinous, there. So this will be a short axis view of the rotator cuff, uh, cable. And there's some really nice articles on that. Um, out online. I don't know if it's something that I'm that we would have permission to post on our institute. I'll look into that. But it, it's a question that has come up several times in the last two years. So look more proximal, not towards the neck, up over the cartilage, and right here. This is a little oval, short axis section of the cable right there. A couple other structures that we need to talk about real quickly while we're here is the um, uh, subacromial subdeltoid bursa comes out from under the acromion, as we know. Uh, this is with a patient, and you can see that their arm is slightly abducted. And when that arm is abducted and we look for subacromial impingement and bunching of tissue as, as, that, uh, as those tissues slide back and forth underneath the chromium, we oftentimes will see a little teardrop of fluid accumulate down here in the distal most part of the subdeltoid bursa. The bursa is lined by peribursal fat, which you see here. Occasionally, you'll only see this hyperechoic line. But if there's any fluid in this potential space, then you'll see a little bit of distension, and you'll recognize that small amount of fluid, which is also very helpful when you're guiding a needle to that spot. And it's an overlying this rotator cuff interval and part of the subscap here. We've got the subacromial subdeltoid interface right there, this thin, 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 almost imperceptible line. And uh, we have layers around that bursa. So what, what you need to be familiar with, and I'll bring the, the zoom level up because we have really nice high resolution here. Um, going to zoom. There we go. And I'm gonna point out each of the structures. The biceps, the supraglenohumeral, the corcohumeral, supraspinatus. Deltoid is up here superficially. 
subdeltoid fascia is that first bright white line. And underneath that is a peribursal fat. And then we've got the actual subacromial bursal interface. And then underneath that is another peribursal fat of the supraspinatus is peritenon. And then we have the actual peritenon and then the supraspinatus. To see these, I'm just going to passively internally and externally rotate ever so slightly. So if you're curious about a bursitis, this is a really good way to see if it's got any adhesion. Is it internal and external rotation from that view? And, and you'll, you'll get that clicking and popping and dragging in this view uh, as a really nice dynamic rotator cuff exam. So really do this, stress that on the bursa, and you'll even see little pockets of the bursa that tend to be more swollen than, than the surrounding pockets of the bursa. While you're there, Daniel, that's a great way to also look for a partial thickness bursal sided tear because you can look for dipping of overlying bursa and deltoid into a, into a tear that's um, just bursal sided um, as well. It's a great point, Bill. I've had it described uh, by our friend uh, Tony Buffard out of Detroit as this is a big wheel here, and then here's a tire. And if you have a flat tire sign, you have volume loss. So somewhere the tires lost volume. You look articular or you look bursal. And uh, that will kind of give you a good reference point as to where your flat tire is originating. So the infraspinatus tendon, we look at in the short axis and the long axis. Um, in the short axis, I oftentimes look at it as I'm looking at short axis views of the supraspinatus. I'll just proceed around to the back of the shoulder from my short axis views of the supraspinatus and interrogate it while I'm there. I'll oftentimes look at the infraspinatus and the long axis at the same time as I'm looking at the supraspinatus as well. But the way I really like to look at the supraspinatus as I've evolved in my experience is to place the transducer along the back in the position that we'd oftentimes use to look at the spinal glenoid notch and at the posterior labrum, which we see here. By doing that and externally rotating the patient's arm, we see the origin uh, or the insertion point of the, um, of the infraspinatus. So if we put this into motion, you can see how internal external rotation pulls that infraspinatus tendon back and forth. And the other thing we can do while we're, while we're looking at the um, myotendinous junction is we can look at the relative echogenicity of muscle versus central tendon. As muscle becomes fatty infiltrated, that distinction of hypoechogenicity hypo versus hyperechogenicity becomes less. They tend to blend in with one another because fatty infiltration reflect, results in brighter echoes being returned to the stronger echoes, thus brighter echoes being returned to the transducer. Let's back to live. And we will already intro us to infraspinatus and the, the relative body position. So Jamie just got her hand across her lap. So that is no longer anatomical position either. So when your patient comes in and their arm is across their, their lap, look for the infraspinatus and thesis way out here laterally. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna start way out here until I see that, that little bird's beak shape that's more flat that I talked about earlier, right there. Not the supraspinatus. That is not supraspinatus. This is infraspinatus. And we're going to follow those fibers posteriorly. You'll see how a lot of them will dive underneath the acromion. If that happens, sometimes it is useful to just have the patient reach and uh, touch the other shoulder. And sometimes that will lower the humeral head enough that I can grab more of those fibers as they're diving underneath that, um, that posterior acromion Edge. So I'm just going to drop my depth just a touch so I can see the glenohumeral joint in relation. And uh, I'm just going to pan my, my transducer right across the fibers of the infraspinatus, which we see here. It's starting to come out to its myotendinous um, split, you know, the, the septations. And if I go in short axis to that here, we can see a cross section of the infraspinatus. It's a multi tenate um, muscle. So as I go more proximal, you can see the central tendon has started to. Um, divide into its, its muscular slips. And if I go more distally, watch this central tendon start to, to form and create one big um, uh, robust tendon gliding at its pinched. You can see it perfectly pinched underneath the humeral head and the acromion here. There it is. And then here it, it comes out again underneath 
uh, out from underneath the acromion. Then we're going to go quickly look at the Teres Minor. And we notice that the Teres Minor comes, uh, comes up from the uh, scapula and inserts onto the humerus. Um, transducer position, I don't have a, an actual line here, but you can kind of see where it'd be positioned and you can imagine that on the patient, short axis view across from it. When we're looking on the short axis, we're basically wanting to look at the infraspinatus here and the teres minor here. And oftentimes we're not really looking for a tear of the teres minor, but we're looking at relative echogenicity. We're looking to see in the patient with a chronic rotator cuff tear, whether we have evidence of fatty atrophy, which oftentimes can involve the infraspinatus if it's fully torn and has been for a while, versus the normal echo architecture of the teres minor, and maybe also compare it uh, when we're looking at the supraspinatus up here, we can look at the overlying trapezius as a comparison muscle for degree of echogenicity. From there, we're going to go look at the acromioclavicular joint. The AC joint uh, is a uh, look at the AC joint is achieved by placing the transducer on top of the patient's shoulder, where we'll see the slightly more recessed acromial side versus the uh, clavicular side, the uh, uh, acromioclavicular ligament uh, or joint capsule here. And we're looking basically for any evidence of. Uh, bony architectural change that would reflect some uh, degenerative uh, disease of the shoulder. That's right. So we'll come up from that supraspinatus area here, and you see the acromion right away. We're just going to keep following that acromion immediately until we see the AC joint. So you want to pan up and down the acromion, just like you see my transducer doing right now. And there we see it marry up with another bone, which is our clavicle. Here we are, AC joint and you can see the ligament really nicely. Um, to avoid compressing any, any fluid collections or possible geyser signs, um, I like to go ahead and heap up some gel on this one. So one quick tip for gel heaps is once you find a structure that you're going to be scanning superficially, this goes for the hand, the wrist, the foot, anything that's really superficial, especially the AC joint. Right there, I've got it nice and centered. I'm gonna let up transducer pressure and there I can see the line that my transducer left. And I'm just going to put a bead of gel down. And I'm going to use my finger, like you see here, as a stilt so I don't compress the gel. And I'm going to slowly sink the transducer down into the gel and work on my angle until that ligament is really nice and bright. And basically, that keeps me from collapsing any pathology. And Jamie could touch her other shoulder, and you get that joint to clap together and maybe see if we have any debris coming out of the joint any signs of osteolysis on the side. She still has her little meniscal homolog that lives there. Uh, we degenerate those as we get older, but um, she still has that little meniscus in the AC joint. Go ahead and relax. And then there you can passively pull down. And I'm just pulling down on her elbow, like a, about 10 pounds of pressure to see if I get that joint to do anything. And as expected, hers is just fine. When you're looking at the posterior shoulder, some, some the anatomy is deeper in everybody, but in some folks it's deep enough that you're going to want to consider going to a curved array transducer with a lower frequency, which gives you greater depth of penetration. You sacrifice a little bit of resolution, but if you can't get deep enough, then it doesn't matter what resolution you have. So for example, this is the same patient, one with the 15, six megahertz transducer. And you notice that we can see the labrum but we're having to work awfully hard to see it. Put on the uh, curved transducer and the margins of the posterior labrum display much better. The other thing that we want to evaluate in the posterior shoulder is the more medial position spinal glenoid notch. With a posterior labral tear, we know that joint fluid can leak out, can come down subcapsular and wall itself off and entrap the suprascapular artery or nerve, excuse me. So I won't ever do a complete shoulder study without looking here to see if there might be um, a uh, spinal glenoid notch ganglion. Here, The importance of doing this with the patient in internal rotation. And the reason for this is that we want to be sure that what we're looking at is not um, a big uh, vein that with external rotation will 
become larger and can be mistaken for a spinal glenoid notch cyst. You'll oftentimes see those spinal glenoid notch cysts paralabral as we see here um, in, in this example of a, of a posterior labral tear. You see a little bit of laxity to the labrum and you see this adjacent cyst. Okay, Daniel, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thanks, Bill. So if you'll notice, um, here's the posterior acromion, that little point shape that we have on the back of our shoulder. It's at the top surface of the middle of your probe, right under that point, and then just fan the beam until you start seeing that really nice glenohumeral joint there. Another tip is to apply a lot of pressure medially towards the spine and level that joint out. Flatten the joint so that it, all your echoes come back to your transducer. If you just follow the surface of the skin, you end up with kind of a, a frustrating um, in, in a lot of patient sizes, the larger they get, I would say the more steep that, um, more steep the angle is to see the glenohumeral joint. So another thing is you're not going to see the spinal glenoid um, if you're just right here on that flat spot. You need to bring this medial side of the transducer very far north, plant the lateral side of the probe, watch the, uh, watch the image change on the, on the left side of the screen. There we start to see that notch show itself really nice. It's nice and deep there. Watch me bring the transducer down and it, you see that I go level over the glenohumeral joint there. So here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show that notch just by bringing the medial side of the probe north. Okay, so I'm gonna put my hand in a more comfortable position there. I'm gonna have Jamie just slowly externally rotate and we're gonna see that vein dilate there in the spinal glenoid notch. There it is. You see this big, dark, hypoechoic structure, right? here, start to dilate and go ahead and internally rotate and externally rotate. There it is. So don't call that a cyst. Don't put a needle in that either. Go ahead and relax. <laughs> and then there you can even see the infraspinate is starting to show its enthesis. Go ahead and externally rotate, Jamie. Let's look up here. There. This, these are the complete fibers across the enthesis of the infraspinatus here while we're in that neck of the woods. Um, I'll go over the overlooked Terry's Minor all the time, right? So to, to see the Terry's Minor real nicely, I just have people um, go find the posterior humeral head and neck junction. It looks just like a hip. Everybody see that on the screen, right? So I've kind of flipped our orientation. There we go. So it looks like the hip's head and neck junction. Here's infraspinatus. All of this muscle down here, Terry's Minor, from here to here. This is the central tendon of the Terry's Minor right there on the neck. And if you were to point your ultrasound beam from inferior to superior, you would have a nice 90 degree slice through the teres minor into the humeral head. And that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm just gonna rotate the transducer on in the yeah. shoulder. But right there, you see the extreme upward angle I'm taking to get a really nice view of that central tendon. I'm trying to keep my hand in a way that I know that you can see um, where, where the transducer is. So. If you do have any questions about this webinar, you can see Bill and Daniel's contact information on this screen. Feel free to send them an email with any questions you may have about this demo of the shoulder ultrasound examination. Thank you for joining us.